In the small village of Argoid, South Wales, a tragic event unfolded on the evening of November 5th, 2014, at the Sahawi Arms Hotel, a local halfway house. Mandy Miles, the landlord of the establishment, was alerted that one of her tenants, Matthew Williams, was violating the rules of the establishment by sharing his room with a woman. Concerned, Mandy and her son decided to check on the situation. After failing to receive a response to their knock, they used a passcode to open the door of the room. It was a scene that would forever be scarred into her memory. Mandy recalls, Matthew was leaning over the lifeless woman on the floor. I knew she wasn't alive by the amount of blood on the floor. Frantically, Mandy dialed 999. The distressing call was later played in court, where she can be heard shouting in horror. He's stabbing her face with a screwdriver. He's actually chewing her face. Blood is everywhere. It's like a horror film. Is this really happening? Before we start, if you find this video fascinating, then at the end, please drop it a like and let me know what you thought about the case. It helps the channel. Also, don't forget to hit subscribe for more. Thank you. Matthew Williams was the eldest of four brothers, hailing from Blackwood in Carefully County. His parents divorced when he was just 10 years old marking a significant turning point in his life. What followed was a descent into a tumultuous world of substance abuse and violence. Williams started smoking softer substances at the tender age of 11. His aggression began to manifest in school, leading to his expulsion for violent behavior just two years later. By the age of 15, Williams had completely dropped out of the education system. In his teenage years, he sought help for his escalating substance problem, but the struggle to control his addiction proved futile. This marked the beginning of a disturbing pattern of criminal behavior that would follow him throughout his life. Williams received his first custodial sentence in a young offenders institute at the age of 15. His criminal record rapidly expanded, accumulating 26 convictions for 78 offenses in total. These offenses varied in severity and type, including assault, wounding with intent, substances and weapons offenses. Over 40 of his crimes led to juvenile custodial sentences, while 14 others landed him in adult prisons. His first referral to mental health services was made in April 1997, following charges of burglary and attempted theft. However, his tenure at the Tai Shahawi Mental Health Unit was brief. After being found smoking softer substances merely two and a half hours after admission, he violated the facility's policy and quickly left. With his revolving door relationship with the criminal justice system and constant battle with substance abuse, William's mental health continued to deteriorate. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia in 2004 an assertion that was later contested by other health professionals, expressing considerable skepticism over the diagnosis. Nevertheless, under the Mental Health Act, Williams was admitted into a psychiatric unit. Following a five-week stay at the unit, he was released into the care of the Carefilly-based community health team. However, this arrangement came to an end in February 2005, when he was once again incarcerated, this time for a period of five years, 
for burglary, theft and wounding offences. Subsequent burglary offences resulted in another prison sentence in 2009. Upon release, he was referred to a community psychiatric nurse. However, these sessions were discontinued after a year, as he did not exhibit any symptoms of psychotic illness. Williams faced a recurring mental health crisis during his subsequent stays in prison, including auditory hallucinations, paranoid ideation, and other forms of delusion. He was prescribed medication to address these issues, but was notably inconsistent in taking it. He often refused the medication, complaining of side effects and expressing his doubts about its effectiveness. By 2014, Williams's prescription for his mental health issues had been halted due to an absence of reported psychotic symptoms. In fact, he seemed to be functioning well within the prison system, maintaining a job as a prison barber. His behavior leading up to his release was characterized as pleasant and polite, with a high level of functioning. A vital detail overlooked was the content of the letters Williams was sending to a former girlfriend. These letters came to light during the inquest into the murder. Initially, a police officer denied knowledge of them. When it was revealed that she had logged them into the police system, she was called back and confirmed her awareness. But her description of these letters was somewhat vague. In one unsettling drawing created by Williams just four months before his release from prison, a grinning skull was depicted with an ominous message beneath. God forgive me for my sins and the ones I am about to do too. These letters were directed to his ex-partner, Emma Thomas, wherein he made threats against her and named a specific police officer. In one instance, Williams wrote that he would beat the F out of Miss Thomas if she refused to get back with him. In another, he threatened a named police officer, stating, I know where blank lives here. I'll tell you now, I'll beat the F out of him. I'll beat his missus, his kids, and anyone that's in his house. Wait and see. I've had it with the police. Furthermore, he ominously wrote, Well, I can't wait to get a nice pair of leather gloves, because I'm going to get away with murder. Trust me, I'm too good, too brave, too ruthless. Within these letters, Williams referred to himself as the man. The same report that Gwent police sent to the CPS, highlighting serious concerns about Williams' mental well-being, was based on these letters. It emphasized his abrupt emotional shifts from love to hatred for Miss Thomas and his ability to carry out threats he made. Despite these letters, the report noted that Miss Thomas did not wish to press charges against Williams. Furthermore, it was stated that adequate safety plans were in place for his release and CPS did not authorize further charges against him. Williams was in prison at the time for blackmailing his friend, Adam Gauntlet, whom he accused of damaging his mobile phone. In the lead up to Williams' release, on October 23rd, 2014, a probation service report evaluated issues relevant to his release. The report noted, Mr. Williams is currently not on any medication since his transfer to Park Prison as the doctor deemed it unnecessary. Mr. Williams expressed that he feels fine but still desires his medication. This issue needs to be addressed. Since returning to Park Prison, Mr. Williams has been reprimanded a total of six times. Two of these incidents involved violent behavior, one of which 
involved him allegedly sending a letter to another prisoner in which he threatened to assault them and their family members upon release. Emma Thomas, now 42, is Williams' ex-girlfriend. She said, he has been violent towards me. It would be when Matthew's head would just go. I can't say there would be a warning because it would just happen. From prison, he kept writing me. He tried to ring me a few times. I was refusing the calls. I was trying to move on with my life. I had some threatening letters from Matthew towards police officers, their wives and children. I knew that Matthew knew where these people lived and I really took what he put in his letters seriously because at the time I thought he really meant it. So I called the police with this letter because I didn't know what else to do. The police came here and they said, there's nothing we can do about it because he hasn't directly threatened the police officer, but he's told it to you in a letter. So I just left with my letter. Finally, she said, I tried to help, but nobody wanted to know. Upon serving his complete 27 month sentence, Matthew Williams left prison without mandatory supervision, without his medication, and without a referral to the community mental health team. It was understood that if he were to encounter any mental health issues, he would reach out to his GP. On release, he was given the option of voluntary support for substance misuse, employment, and housing, but he refused stating he had had enough of police and probation over the years. Without a home to return to, Williams was labelled as homeless. He attempted to secure housing in Newport to be closer to his father, but his efforts were in vain. Consequently, he was allocated a room in the Sahawi Arms Hotel, a facility that had been providing emergency bed and breakfast since 2008. Once established at the hotel, Williams was assessed by a charity worker to gauge his housing needs. The worker described Williams as quiet, with peculiar eyes and a touch of sadness, but generally perceived to be doing very well. Williams, however, did not maintain further contact with the charity. In the two weeks, following his release from prison. Those who interacted with Williams described him as being in a low mood and having a pessimistic outlook towards the future. Despite this, they did not observe any signs indicative of psychosis or mental illness. His best friend, Rodery Moore, said Williams seemed fine after his release from jail but deteriorated after the first couple of days. He said he was taking substances on a daily basis. He said when he looked at a can of coke, he could see faces. He wasn't very well. He was seeing things, hallucinating. He was annoyed and on edge, depressed. He couldn't get any medication. His mother was trying very hard to get someone to see him. Matthew Williams and Keres Yem had developed what was described as a flirty relationship in the two weeks since meeting in a nightclub. According to Moore, Williams displayed no noticeable signs of aggression towards Keres during their interactions. On the night of the tragic incident, Williams, Moore and Keres engaged in substance use and drank lager together. Later that night, Williams and Keres left together to go back to the Sahari Arms Hotel. Earlier, Williams had been on a call with Keres's ex-boyfriend, whom he knew from his time in prison. Moore said that it was a weird situation, noting how Williams had ended up meeting Keres after being incarcerated with her former partner. In a statement given by Keres's mother, Paula Yem, 
it was noted that Keres was involved in what her mother deemed a controlling relationship with a man named Jay, who served time in prison alongside Williams. Paula indicated that Keres and Jay had plans to build a life together after his release, and Jay had warned Keres to steer clear of Williams. The inquest revealed that Williams had shown signs of distress whilst watching a documentary about Broadmoor, a psychiatric hospital with Keres. Upon watching the show, he said, what are you watching these psychos for? Before lashing out in the type of violent outburst his ex-girlfriend had previously spoken about. The extent of the injuries inflicted upon Keres during Williams' attack were horrific. He had used a screwdriver to brutally mutilate her face, leading to the removal of her eyes, nose, ears and mouth. As a result, both facial arteries were severed. Mandy Miles, the landlord of the Sahari Arms Hotel, first learned that Williams was in his room with a woman at around 12.30am when her son Christian informed her. Williams had not signed into the hotel register and Mandy was unaware that he was even on the premises. Concerned by reports of a woman shouting for help from Williams' room, Mandy and Christian attempted to gain access. Williams did not respond to their knocks and requests for him to open the door. Assuming the noises they heard earlier were of an intimate nature, they decided to enter the room using a key code. At this point, other residents had gathered in the hallway. The scene that awaited them was horrific. Williams was on top of a lifeless body. The room was awash with blood and there were pieces of broken china scattered around the room. Overwhelmed by the grisly sight, Mandy could not fully describe the extent of the 22-year-old Keres Yem's injuries, but she realized that Keres was beyond saving. It would later turn out that Keres had 85 individual injuries to her body, mainly to her face and neck, which were both severely cut open. Confronted with this terrifying situation, Mandy took the difficult decision to lock Williams in the room whilst she called the emergency services. She feared for the safety of the other hotel residents and had to ensure that Williams couldn't escape before help arrived. During the frantic 999 call, Mandy described the scene, stating that Williams was shoving a screwdriver in Keres's face. He's actually chewing her face, she said. The operator advised her to evacuate the hotel due to the impending arrival of several police officers. Police arrived at the hotel 14 minutes after Mandy's call. Mandy described the few seconds she opened the door to the room as some of the most haunting of her life. She portrayed Williams as appearing demonic, possessed and having black eyes, with blood dripping from his mouth. His appearance was so altered and terrifying that she likened him to Darth Maul, a character from the Star Wars saga known for his red and black facial markings. Despite the police officers ordering Williams to lie down, he resisted arrest. They had to taser him four times before he was subdued. Following this altercation, Williams suffered a cardiac arrest and died. Mandy said that she had no idea about Williams' past issues, stating that she gives each tenant a form to fill in and where it asks about any previous mental health issues, Williams simply circled no. She said he had been really great. He asked for permission from the council to stay out. He asked me if I could do his washing. I told him that he was doing really well. I didn't have any fear of Matthew. I didn't know anything about him. The council are not told either. It's always data protection. All I get is his name, his date of birth, and ask if there are any issues. 
That's it. If there's anything nasty, I don't want that here. I've never had any hardened criminals. If I'd have known about his past, I wouldn't have been in that situation. Mandy added that Williams had told her he had been in prison for theft rather than assaulting his ex-partner. It's terrifying, she added. Mandy has now called for more information to be shared between agencies so that she knows people's backgrounds before she accepts them as residents. She said, I need to know who is walking through my door. It's important to clarify that subsequent scientific examination confirmed that Williams wasn't actually chewing Keres's face, contrary to the initial horrifying perception. According to Mandy, it looked as though he was, without speculating too much. We know that there was blood all over his face. Perhaps he was rubbing his face against her wounds. We can't say for certain. Regardless, the image remains profoundly disturbing. Kerez Yem, a young woman with her whole life ahead of her, became an innocent victim of a system that failed to protect her. That's the end of this episode. Until next time, stay sane.